Welcome to the first episode of the Blended Beat Coffee Grab podcast. Each week we host a different guest who will bring you insights, ideas, current trends, and where blended learning is going in health professions education. Our very first guest is none other than our Dean, Professor Shabir Mahdi, um, and we're going to be talking to him today a little bit about his vision for blended learning in the Faculty of Health Sciences. Welcome, Professor Mahdi. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Excited to be here. The faculty has a, a lot of initiatives around blended learning. There's uh, Professor Lala's pediatric clinical videos. Um, there's the E-Zone, which obviously is my baby, um, that looks at active blended learning that's happening in the classroom. Um, what is your sort of impression or how do you value blended learning in the Faculty of Health Sciences as a way to engage with students? Um, and where do you see it going? Yeah, so like you mentioned, I started at the university in 1985. Uh, and over time, I've been reflecting on what has been happening in the faculty. And obviously, my training was uh, in the MBBCH program. Mm -hmm. And I sort of engaged with students that were in the MBBCH program. And what struck me until just before COVID-19, was that it appeared that the manner in which we were engaging with students, the manner in which we were delivering content, the manner in which we were trying to get students to engage with knowledge, hadn't actually shifted much mm -hmm. compared to what it was in 1985. <laughs> and the that is- standing that, in front uh, and talking at. <laughs> uh, absolutely, and that is a problem. There have been some tweaks, there's been thematic sort of approaches, uh, but in terms of the bigger picture, mm -hmm. seem, there seems to be something that's lacking. Now, we're living in a world that is changing exponentially by the day, and that is not an exaggeration. Uh, when we see what has happened just uh, since towards the end of last year and up until now with ChatGPT and the phenomenal amount of knowledge that's been generated and its ability to actually, in a sense, put uh, knowledge that otherwise wouldn't have been available to us right in front of us at the press of a button. Absolutely. Those are fundamental changes in terms of how knowledge is being delivered and the potential to actually make use of these two sort of tools. So I think the approach that we're taking in the faculty comes at a very timeless moment uh, in history, in fact, mm -hmm. and I'm not exaggerating again. Uh, we need to ask ourselves, are we using the best tools that are available, despite all of the resource constraints we might face, mm -hmm. are we using the best tools to be able to deliver knowledge to our students in a manner which assists them in terms of being able to collate the knowledge and at the same time internalize it and then use that knowledge. And that is the challenge we face. So gone are the days uh, that we need to just be delivering content. It's not about delivering content, it's a manner in which content is delivered, which will influence the ability of the students to absorb what is really overload of content at this point in time. And so we, we are, we, expect our students to absorb much more and we can't fault ourselves because that is the way the world is evolving. There's much more knowledge that's generated and consequently you need to be able to absorb more to remain relevant. Mm -hmm. So there's no compromising that we need to our students to remain relevant. Mm -hmm. But we need to become innovative in how we go about imparting that knowledge, how we do the teaching and training and that's where blended learning in my mind comes into being. We shouldn't fool ourselves that as a university, we do not have the breadth of expertise that's required to deliver content on many fronts. But we've got opportunities. We've got opportunities that we need to leverage off, uh, be it involving alumni or even be it actually using resources that are freely available in the public domain on the internet mm -hmm. and see how we integrate that in terms of the manner in which we deliver content as well as the type of content that we actually deliver to students. So one of the initiatives that you sort of mentioned uh, is something that started off with uh, two pediatricians, uh, Prof. Uh, Zia Denga and Prof. Sinjilala. And they were becoming frustrated as an example that we had this different approach to how we were training medical students. But when they came to the bedside, they lacked fundamental skills uh, in terms of how to approach the patient. So they asked themselves, where is this gap? Uh, and then they realized that students are simply not being delivered content appropriately at an early stage of the training, which equips them to come to the bedside and then to go to the next step of the training. So they decided, well, we've got all of this uh, IT equipment around us. We've got all of this uh, people at the 
dealing with education and everything else. Why don't we have a different approach to this? And they came up with, I wouldn't even call it novel because there's other people that have done similar, but in a different context. So in a context specific uh, sort of scene, they decided, well, we'll make use of this and let us start becoming innovative in terms of how we prepare students to take that next step from uh, sort of the lecture theater into the clinical space. And that is uh, now developing this sort of modules which equips students in terms of understanding how to approach a patient, how to examine a patient before they actually put their hands on a patient so that by the time they come to the bed, say they're comfortable, mm-hmm. that they've been adequately equipped in terms of how to engage with a patient. Now, this is something which is practical. It's not even theoretical. It's not even content material. Yeah, it's just practical. It's clinical. It's uh, skills, absolutely. Yeah. And in the past, we would say, well, you need to develop that skill by seeing the patient. But it's unfair on the patient for someone that's ill-equipped to actually examine them to be prodding around uh, and causing discomfort. So this is obviously leveraging on a sort of technology to better equip our students to basically interface with students on a much more... Uh, on a on a basis which is much more kind to the patients themselves but at the same time the students also are much more comfortable in terms of what they're doing i was going to say i think it, it gives the students confidence going into a clinical environment if even on the bus on their way to the clinical they can watch a video because they know that they're likely to get this type of pediatric patient or and and that way they walk into the environment feeling confident and prepared and and that they they know what they're going to be doing and as you say it respects the patient's rights as well which is is very important Uh, uh, absolutely absolutely Mm -hmm. and i think we need to bring that into our lecture theaters Uh, so as an example i had an opportunity after more than 15 years of lecturing one of our undergraduate classes and the part of the lecture which excited the class most was not me talking to them but showing them a video to sort of internalize the concepts which i was trying to get through now that's not a video that i generated uh, it was a snippet that was generated by someone else an excellent sort of piece in terms of getting students to understand how a vaccine works now i could easily have rambled on for one hour about what the vaccine is but it's not going to really settle in the mind of a student in terms of what this vaccine is actually doing so when we're talking of blended learning it's not about getting away from face-to-face. Yeah. Face-to-face engagement remains so essential. Important. Absolutely. And especially for a university such as the Vitwadzis Rand, and even more so for a faculty of health sciences, face-to-face engagement between the lecturers and the students is something that we're not going to get away from. And we should resist any push to just deliver content online and believe that we're doing anyone justice by doing that. That is not what blended learning is about. But it's about integrating into our lectures and using the type of tools that are available in the public domain and see how we actually use that as part of our lectures to basically get students excited, that they actually want to come to the class. Absolutely. Uh, And I think that's where we're lacking at the moment. The lecturers complain that students are not coming to my class. When I ask the students, why don't you come to the lectures? They tell me, well, it doesn't help us to come to lectures when the lecturer is just reading from the PowerPoint slide they put up on a they board. They could just as easily read the textbook uh, and come away with the same information. Uh, I mean, I, I think that that's very valid. I, I think the students learn best when they're doing. Um, and whether that's theoretical content or whether it's clinical um, and skills, if they're actively participating in whatever the the knowledge content piece is, they're more likely to internalize, memorize. Yeah. It reduces the cognitive load. They the concentration spans stick with the the program. Um, and I mean, I think we we know that the the 50 minute standard lecture where somebody stands in the front and just talks at the their students is not going to get the students really engaged or thinking about that material. Um, and I think that brings me to the, the emergency remote online solutions that we had um, during the pandemic, where a lot of people converted their their 50 minute lectures into 50 or 55 minute voiceover PowerPoints um, and uploaded those. Um, that, that was an emergency response. I mean, it was a way of us getting at the students on the spot. Um, But we need to transition now. And as you say, we need to move away from just giving the students passive content and shifting to blended learning where the students are actively engaged. Yeah. Well, we need to do more in transition. We need to totally abandon (laughs) any habit 
of delivering voice over PowerPoint presentations to students and believe that we're actually delivering content. Mm -hmm. Because the students could get much more information in a much more structured manner by going to YouTube and basically uh, doing a search for exactly mm -hmm. the same. So that needs to be abandoned completely. As you correctly pointed out, it was required as an emergency measure at a point in time, but it was never the intention of the faculty or the university for that to become the norm. Mm -hmm. And any lecturer be that believes that just their main purpose is just to deliver content actually misses a point mm -hmm. about why students are here. They're here to learn. Mm -hmm. And to learn means that they need to be adequately taught. And to be adequately taught, we need to use every tool that's available to us to ensure that we're actually providing content in a manner where students would become excited about the content and internalize the content. So I wouldn't say that we need to transition from voice over PowerPoint presentations. That needs to be abandoned totally. Yes. And we need to Different seriously times. ask ourselves, what is blended learning and how do we actually use the tools available to us to actually impart knowledge? I agree totally. And I think it doesn't mean abandoning online. It means abandoning the types of content that are not actually going to produce a good learning outcome. Absolutely. Um, and we want the students actively engaged. So if they're doing an online quiz that relates to some of the content, if they're participating in, in a game or a challenge, or those are the things that, that ignite the students' thinking. If you're giving them a scenario and making them have a discussion online where they've actually got to produce their own insights, they've got to use clinical reasoning, they've got to use judgment, they've got to have some argumentation, they've got to be able to back up what Absolutely. they're saying. Um, it's a very different kind of thing to giving them notes or giving them a voice over PowerPoint. Uh, so, absolutely. Uh, uh, why is blended learning valuable in, in health professions um, in terms of readying our students for the 21st century world of work? Um, and why is it valuable in health sciences? Uh, you know, where are we going that that this is something that we need our students to be equipped with? Yeah, so we're, we're looking at, diff I wouldn't say different, but uh, we need to sort of allow for our students to be much more critical in thought. And for me, when we talk of critical in thought, it means that we need to challenge our students. And one of the ways of challenging students is a flip learning concept, where we use these tools, we familiarize students with these tools that are out in the public domain, actually get them to start engaging with the tools before they come to the lecture theater on the same subject. Mm -hmm. right? And that is when we start getting the interaction rather than just the didactic type of approach, where we start getting the interaction uh, going. Uh, but at the end of the day, again, it goes down to the issue uh, that I mentioned, is that knowledge is increasing at an expo exponential rate. Uh, we can't I, keep up. Yeah, when I was a med medical student, I was told that the half-life of knowledge was about nine to 10 years. This was when I graduated in 1990. I was told that in nine to 10 years, everything that you've learned now, most of it won't be relevant. Mm. What do we see happening right now? The half-life of knowledge is shrinking to one to two months. Okay, uh, that is it's frightening. Ridiculous. It's frightening. It means that anything that you learned a few years ago is likely to be outdated. Uh, in between the time of doing your third year of medicine and uh, graduating, as an example, you probably need to relearn a fair amount because of the progress that's been made, not because you were taught anything wrong, but just simply because of the progress that is made. So when it comes to blended learning, this is, we need to start introducing these concepts to students in terms of how they need to engage with technology, how they need to engage with material that would otherwise not be provided to them on a table, but that is still available to them freely in a public domain. So those sort of engagements, and it's really about ensuring that our students are trained appropriately and remain relevant to the 21st century and remain competitive at an international level. Absolutely. And those are the challenges that we face. And the only way, we, we can't do it. We can't do it just by having lecturers deliver on material online. We can't do it without the students starting to take responsibility mm -hmm. for their own learning. And that's also a critical component. I think, I think that raises a very important aspect because um, as you say knowledge is everywhere and they have access to knowledge in the moment even at the bedside or when they come across a patient that they've never seen this diagnostic profile or combination of diagnoses in, in a single patient. Having access to information um, and knowing how to use it, knowing how to validate that this information is current, that it is the, the best practice or evidence-based yeah. um, and that they, 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 they are able to critically review in a, in a short time span that allows them to act and apply 
in the moment. And I think that is a skill that students need to learn. It doesn't come naturally, um, but I, I do think understanding what is imp what is valid information and how to get your fingertips on the current evidence is, yeah. is important. Uh, absolutely. And what you're talking about, we're talking about blended learning on one hand, we're talking of now blended practice. Mm. Uh, and that's going to be the future. Uh, and as a faculty, part of what we initiated uh, when I started as Dean was a revision of the curriculum. And it's important for the curriculum revision to take place, not just about content, but also about what exactly is it that we're going to be, Israel, it speaks to content, what is it that we're going to be uh, teaching students? So in this day and age, for any med medical curriculum, uh, even for any curriculum in any of the health sciences, feel not to include AI and the use of AI as part of practice mm -hmm. basically means that we're not training students for the 21st century. Uh, when we talk of the type of scenario that you talked about, uh, there's a number of tools that have already been, besides ChatGPT, there are other tools that have now been designed specific for healthcare. Uh, to the point that it would embarrass any professor in terms of being able to come up with a differential diagnosis, with a, with a diagnostic plan, with a management plan. Right now, these are tools that are already out there in the public domain, right? And it's our responsibility to ensure that our students are equipped to know how to use those tools and use it responsibly. So it's not that you're going to believe everything that you see or read, uh, especially in this era of misinformation and disinformation, we need to be careful, but we need to guide our students as to which tools are appropriate and how to be used those tools responsibly in the interest of the patients. And I think interest of the patients is a key factor because um, by using good diagnostic tools that are starting to emerge, you are able to diagnose a patient far quicker um, based on the clinicals, the, yeah. you know, the lab tests cool. and, and everything, the, the likelihood of them profiling in a particular way, which means that you actually get access to, to or more patients have access to the healthcare system because the processes are, are more efficient. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, so I mean, I think, I think Blended learning is the starting point of planting the seeds in our undergraduates, um, but it really is about how you use the technology and how you build it into your healthcare practice as you emerge as a, as a graduate. So Absolutely. Is there anything else you'd like to add or bring, bring up um, before well, we close? I mean, as a Dean, what I'm really excited about is uh, the people that we have in the faculty uh, and this, the success of our sort of change in approach and how we engage with students, how we deliver content, how we get students excited it really depends on the staff in the faculty and people like yourself uh, and others. I think that really is exciting that we have people that are passionate about wanting to do what's in the best interest of the students. It also brings about some level of equity in terms of, the, of learning abilities on the part of students. Not all students are equally equipped when they come to the university. And by making this sort of materials available at, uh, at the convenience of the students, obviously also assist the students in terms of ensuring success across uh, the sort of socioeconomic divide. And I think that's another important component that we need to keep in mind. And again, it also speaks about how we use blended learning to actually assist those students that are most, more disadvantaged when they come into a university environment compared to the student that perhaps had the privilege of going to a better resource uh, school. So I think there's a number of other dimensions. The equity part of uh, what blended learning uh, offers us is something that we can't also ignore. But at the end of the day, like I said, success of this program depends on our staff and I'm convinced that in the faculty we're getting the right people in place to take us to where we should be as a faculty in assisting our students to be successful. Um, I'm very excited about the way forward, I really am. So with that, thank you, Professor Mahdi, for joining us today. Oh, thank you for the invite. Very much enjoyed it. And that was the Blended Beat Coffee Grab podcast. Each week we'll bring you a new guest. And so look out for next week's edition. Mm -hmm.